Okay, just I'm not going to be watching it. I'm just seeing it. Okay. Um, as it comes up, okay. if I can find the I, channel. I think we are live. Okay. Um, great. Can I just get confirmation, those of you who are watching, that you can hear me and you can see me? Um, currently, I can hear the popping sound, so that means you should be able to hear me, but it would be helpful if I get a quick confirmation that, yes, um, that you can hear me. Thank you. And also, can we get quick sound check for our guest called Faye, that you can see her and hear her clearly? Sister, would you like hi. to say hi to everyone and then tell us one sentence something for the sound check purpose? Hi, how is everybody? I hope everybody is good. It's midweek, so I expect everyone is tired. Um, but weekend's coming up. Can everybody hear me? Yes, uh, so sound it all looks okay. I'm not sure if people are tired, it's just middle of the week. So, like, people usually get tired on Sunday nights in this part of the world. Um, can I also get quick check regarding um, if you can hear this funny popping sound or not? Because I strongly believe and I am very uh, pleased with myself I fixed the popping sound but hopefully hopefully it is really really fixed and so what we want to do tonight is um, so we've got first time first time in the CCI live stream we have someone who is not Muslim or who is not Christian. So we've got atheist with us and we want to talk about mainly life as a Muslim woman because um, I recently received lots of messages not recently actually it's been last couple of weeks that lots of Muslims females are becoming Muslim and Islam is so awesome. So what I thought is, theologically, I'm sure we all know Islam is not that awesome at all. But uh, we want to kind of look in the reality side of it, how um, in the reality, how is how was life as a Muslim? So what I have done was, uh, we got in touch with Faye. She's based in England. And we just want to talk about little bit about her and what the life looked like as a Muslim. So as we talk about this topic, can I gently ask you to please, please keep your comments in English. Please, please do not share anyone's personal details. I will block you. I know how to do the blocking now. And also try to have the conversations in the chat around the topic so everyone can like we won't be wasting our time so that's the kind of overall plan but also Faye are you giving me permission to be recorded in this live stream of course yeah okay thank you so um, since I got the permission from you can you just tell us a little bit about who you are and what do you do and your link with Islam if there is any yeah so my name is Faye. Um, I, my general nine to five is that I'm an educator. I work in um, secondary schools and colleges with young people who have learning difficulties. Um, and I'm 24 years old, almost 25. And I'm, I live in the UK. I've lived in London for most of my life. I was born in Bangladesh and I spent a summer there. Um, I was born into a Muslim family who originally were not practicing at all. But when I was about 11 years old, my father joined um, a Muslim group called the Tablig Jamaat. And then uh, I was also put into an Islamic school. And when I was 14, I joined the Salafi movement, um, which was lots of not, they're just 
prohibit all kinds of fun. Um, and then I left Islam in 2017, but I didn't, uh, I wasn't openly an ex-Muslim until October 2018. So since leaving, I've been, because on, on leaving in 2018, I, I was completely disowned from my family. Um, so since then, I've been an ex-Muslim activist. I've been working alongside a lot of organizations like the Council of Ex-Muslims, like Faith to Faithless, um, Humanist UK, um, to do speeches and mainly just awareness and activism. And I'm working on a few projects with those different organizations. Thank you. Um, as a Christian, my heart and desire of my God is one day you will come and worship him. But that will be another topic we can discuss tonight. Um, I want to, first of all, focus on until um, 2017. So, yeah. and thank you for sharing your age. Usually in Britain, that's not very, <laughs> that's not very nice things to do. So, so um, before your family and you decided to become a Salafi, can you yeah. just tell me a little bit about what life looked like for you? So I was a very young girl. If I'm completely honest, um, my childhood was very, it wasn't the best childhood. So I, I feel like I've blocked out a lot of it. There's only patches that I remember of my childhood. Um, but for the most part, um, very few women in my family wore hijabs when I was younger. Uh, my father didn't pray. Um, no one fasted in my family. Um, we were just Muslim by name. Like when we, when we, met people we would go to eat prayers and things like that but for the most part we weren't praying we weren't fasting no one was covering um and it wasn't something that was uh done a lot my mother was quite religious and my mother's family was quite religious because um she was from bangladesh she wasn't uh raised here in the uk um and she was religious because her grandfather was an alim in bangladesh um, so my grandmother was quite um, uh, practicing and so my mother was as well. But even she was an extreme. She would pray and um, she wore the hijab, but it was very like a cultural form. Like it wasn't all black. It wasn't loose fitting. It was just uh, just like a very casual understanding of hijab. Um, you know, we still, uh, I had... Christian friends. I had other friends of other religions who would come to my house and they would play at my house. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a very, it wasn't perfect, but it was a very nice life. Like it was very easygoing. Like we would go to the beaches, we would see people. Um, I think a lot of that changed after we became more conservative. Um, what is the date for that? Approximate? So that would have been before 2006. 2000, before 2006. So yeah. before 2006, you would identify yourself as Muslim, but not that much knowing about Islam and not following yeah. the Quran as faithfully as some others would do. Yeah. Uh, would you, were you able to play outside with boys and with girls? Uh, not at that point. I think I was allowed up until I was about eight, I would say. And then after eight years old, my mother told me that it's not um, appropriate for me to be playing with boys, not even with my own cousins. Um, I was wearing the hijab since I was about five or six years old. Um, so that was already there. But she, she had told me that I'm becoming a woman and things like that. So I couldn't be playing with boys. Um, uh, at that time, um, before uh, my family had joined these different groups, I was allowed to play outside. Like I would ride bicycles and I would, um, you know, go to the park and things like that. That was OK. But it was uh, and I think I was also swimming at the time. Um, but after the conservatism, that wasn't um, permissible anymore. OK. And um, so what made... Can you remember what made your family to um, what made your family to kind of become Salafi or feel they need to follow Islam a little bit more deeper? So 
with my mother, she was always kind of a casual Muslim. Um, she never felt as though she needed to do that. Uh, but the main pressure for changing in that direction, and it led my whole family to changing, was my father. And there were, I feel like there were a lot of reasons for it, but I was so young, I don't remember a lot of things. Um, my father has psychological issues and he hasn't been treated for them. Um, as someone who is a student of psychology and has spent a significant amount of time with my own father, I do think that he has a lot of psychological issues. I remember when I was very young, he was on um, a form of medication, um, which my other family members have described as antipsychosis or antidepressants, but I'm not entirely sure what it was. But he was going through a lot of things. It was a time of change, I think, like we had just separated from my grandmother's house. And for some reason, he felt that that was extremely traumatic for him. Um, there were other things going on, like my grandfather had had two strokes, so there was also health complications. So his father was going through all these health issues. Um, so I think that he started seeking this, like this more uh, religious or Salafi understanding of Islam, or more deeper understanding of Islam. Um, as an escape route to solve all his problems. Um, that's what I think anyway. Uh, obviously, I was about 10 or 11 years old, so I can't remember it. But looking back, in hindsight, that's what it seems to be. Um, and I think that that's a, that, that's a reason for a lot of people to turn to extreme versions of religions is to escape from the problems that they just don't want to deal with. Um, it, it makes them feel comfortable in a certain way. And also my father, he he definitely is a narcissist. And I think that being religious and being pious made him feel better about himself because he could tell himself that he was good. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's that's what I felt like because all of his um, all of the people that he met at the mosques and all of the friends that he made there would always talk about how good he was as a person. But because I knew him, much more personally and much more intimately, I knew that a lot of the things that they were saying wasn't, it didn't add up because I saw a completely different picture of him. Um, even when I was a Muslim, like he, he was, because he was my father, I made a lot of excuses for him. But when these people talked about how giving and generous he was, that was just something that I didn't identify with, for example, because I knew he wasn't a generous person. <laughs> He wasn't generous with, with his own family, with his own children. So how was he generous in the slightest, you know? Um, as, so those are the reasons that I can think of. Yeah. So um, it seems to me that as the time went on, as he joined in this Salafi movement or Salafi Islam, that he felt more identity. And then community yeah. came with it. So that kind of helped him to feel better. Uh, just a yeah. quick question. So that takes place, like you were, you expressed that around, you expressed that around when you were eight years old, suddenly there were certain limitations came from your mother regarding the segregation on the engaging with boys or with girls. Um, yeah. And you say that's the reason because you are becoming adult. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure that age is approximate eight. Okay. Yeah. It's not something like um, we would say until you turn to teenage. No. So it seems um, life was kind of normal. Um, so I'm from Turkey, for example. It is Muslim majority country and very, very similar uh, kind of settings. Uh, would, you, would you know before your family joined the Salafi, Salafi Islam, where you praying uh were you fasting um i was I, I had learned how to pray and my mother would encourage me to pray but i wasn't praying five times a day um i would pray maybe twice or three times with her because it was just time to spend with my mother honestly like that's that's the time that we spent together um, in terms of fasting, I did fast from quite a young age but it was more be and my mother didn't say that i had to um, it was more a case of me wanting to because everyone else was fasting. And I grew up with a big family. I grew up with all my uncles and my aunts and my grandparents. We all lived in one house. 
so no one was eating and as a small child I felt bad about eating because no one else was eating and I also wasn't very fond of eating um it was a it was a real point of stress for my mother because she would sit there for hours with me trying to feed me so um I would say that I, I don't want to eat and I would refuse to eat um but she never pushed it on me she would she would encourage the praying but I don't think I started fasting until I had started my period which was when I was like 11 um so yeah okay just uh, sorry I don't want to be meanful but I just wanted to express for those of you those of people who are watching you had your period when you were at 11 years old okay? yeah because it will as we go on I am sure um, there will be comments on uh, age of marriage, uh, Aisha's marriage with Muhammad and Aisha's period is going to come up in that line. I just wanted to express. So you yeah. had your period when you were approximately 11 years old. Um, and you were encouraged to practice Islam by fasting and praying, but there was no any obligation. Yeah. So it seems to me in that stage things are pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when father who decides to, okay, now we are going to follow Islam as it was practiced in the time of Muhammad and by early caliphs, which is um, early Sahaba, early Sahabais. Um, so uh, how do things are changed for you? So the main thing... The, the biggest change was um, that I was put into an Islamic school um, and that changed that changed a lot of things for me because I was very young. I was 11 years old when I joined that school. And, so what are um, you learning in Islamic school? Uh, I'll get to that. Let me explain the, the move for it. I think when I was when I was that young, I was very much my father's daughter. I, I wanted to make him happy. I wanted to make him proud. If you asked me then, I would have said he's my favorite parent. Um, I loved him and everything that he was interested in, I was interested in. Um, so when he told me I was going to this Islamic school, I was really, first, the, my first reaction was, why am I going to an Islamic school? Um, because I had already applied to go to a different school and I was really excited about going to this other school. And he told me some stuff about how no, this one's better because this one will prepare you for the hereafter. Um, and I asked him, what is the hereafter? And he said, well, when you die, there's a, a hellfire and a paradise. And this school is going to prepare you so that you, when you die, you'll go to paradise. Um, so I believed everything he said. I was a dumb kid. Um, and I said, OK, I'll go to this school. And when I first saw the school, before it started, so normally in the UK, our schools start in September, and my father had showed me the route to get there um, in August just to see the school. And when I first saw it, I said, where is it? Because it wasn't a school. And he said, it's right there. And it was just these, this flat, like it was this house. Um, it was between a, like a, a corner store and a funeral service. It was just a house that people lived in. Um, and I asked him, how is this a school? This is just a house. And he said, no, this is a school. It's a new school. And there's only 12 students. And uh, you have to wear your hijab and you have to wear an abaya to go there. Um, and they'll give you a big list and, and you'll read Quran there. You'll have Islamic studies and you'll have all your other subjects as well, like math, science, English, all of that stuff. Um, and there were a lot of really not very fun things at this school. For the most part, the secular education was really bad. Uh, most of our teachers weren't qualified. Some of them were volunteers. Um, and, and sometimes they just weren't teachers. But Islamic studies was very much focused on. Um, it was called religious studies, but all we studied was, was Islam. We studied the Quran. We studied Tafsir. We studied Hadith. We studied Usul al-Fiqh. We studied... Um, the life of the prophet and the life of the four rightly guided caliphs. Um, and I think for the most part, that was everything. Uh, and it, that's no small amount of information. And this, uh, the teacher had come from, this school was based in Hendon, so it was um, run by Hendon Mosque. 
Um, and Hendon Mosque is notoriously conservative. They are run under the Tablik Jamaat or the Daubandi movement in uh, Pakistan and India and the Indian subcontinent. Um, and that's the that's the methodology that we followed. Uh, they taught us from the four madahib, so Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, and Hanbali. But we mainly learned Hanafi and Shafi'i uh, fiqh. Um, so that's what we learned. We learned about the Sharia punishments. We learned about all the um, gruesome and gory bits of the Prophet's life. Um, they literally hid nothing from us. Okay. Um so as you were learning those kind, those informations, mm-hmm. um, were you being taught from early sources or it was more like modern sources? Um, it was a mixture. So early sources were talking like within the first five to six hundred years after the Prophet's death. Okay. Right. Yeah. So that's what we were learning. Mm-hmm. We were studying... Um, so I, I can't remember the title of the book. I think it was the 40 of Imam Nawawi's hadith, which Imam Nawawi is quite a respected, um, uh, figure in Islam. Yeah. Uh, we were studying Bukhari, we were studying Sahih Muslim, we were studying, um, the Quran. We went briefly into the Sahih Sitta, which is the six most, um, like valued yeah. hadith books. Um, and we were learning about the four fiqhs, but we only learned the two fiqhs. Um, so of Imam Ahmed, uh, not Ahmed ibn Hanbal. We learned about Hanifian. Ahmed ibn Hanbal, but we learned yeah. about um, Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi'i okay. specifically. Okay. Um, so um, we also learned Arabic. Um, yeah, I, I remember you helped me out at Speakers Corner when I needed help with the different Arabic Qurans a while back. A yeah. um, couple of things you expressed that when your father decided to send you to this um, Islamic school, you were just a damn kid who didn't kind of question in that time. I think um, it is very common because your father is the one you trust most. Yeah. All the information he gives you like they are your family, they are biologically programmed to look after you, they are biologically programmed to take care of you. So you yeah. are biologically like programmed to trust one another. Uh, so I would say, I wouldn't say you were damn kid, but you were just like kid who was falling in love with father and with mother. Mm-hmm. Um, so before you went to school, you were just wearing simple hijab, did, did your dress code change from hijab to burqa or were you wearing the same dress code? There was a very quick succession. So it changed from hijab and it, so it was just like a it's just like a pullover hijab and just went up to like here and it changed to like a full hijab and a full abaya. But also uh, after a few months, I actually started wearing the niqab as well at 11 years old. Yeah. Um, and I started doing that because my Islamic studies teacher wore it. And I asked her, why do you wear that on your face? And she said, because God likes people who are modest. So I, I wanted to make God happy and I put it on. Um, and my mother was worried because um, she she was worried that someone would harass me. Um, and I said, no, it's okay. Like the, the prophet struggled and the, and the companion struggled. So I'm going to struggle as well. If that happens to me, it happens to me. And my dad, um, kind of, uh, said to my mom, I'll let her do what she wants. Uh, no one talked me out of it. So I wore it until I was about 20 and then the niqab came off, but I didn't take off my hijab until 2018. I don't think. So, um, you were wearing niqab in the sense, actually, you will be more modest. Yeah. Okay. Um, and of course, that means you won't be abused, you won't get attacked, those kind of basic things. Um, yeah. So, just want to go back to the Islamic school and education. Uh, as you were taught to recite the Quran, learn the Quran. Yeah. This might be personal, you don't have to answer. Have you ever got beaten because you recite the surah wrong or you didn't do your homework on time? So I've I've seen other kids get beaten. I was really good at reciting the Quran. I was top of my class. <laughs> uh, 
um, and it's I don't know why I'm still really proud of it because it was something it was a skill that I really mastered because I'd been going to madrasa since I was um, quite young um, so my mother used to take me to madrasas to learn like the alphabet and how to read the Quran so I've I've from a young age, I've, I've known how to recite it. I've memorized a lot of the surahs um, or the chapters from when I was like six, seven years old. So I, I had the I had a head start. But in that school, I did see others get beaten, but yeah. not not me because I was a model student. Wow. Good. Um, it's rare to meet up with people who hasn't been beaten in these madrasas. <laughs> um, yeah. And- there was a segregation, boys and girls? It was an only girls school. It was only girls school, okay. Yeah. So, as um, you kind of start reciting the Quran, as you start learning what you've been taught about Islam, um, can I ask, uh, do you remember what were you taught about non-Muslims and even Christians? Well, um we were taught that they were all going to burn in hell. <laughs> I think that's the main thing. Um, we weren't, because it's still the UK, we were told to respect them and things like that. But ultimately, they're not your friends and you shouldn't make friends with them because um, they could influence you badly. Um, and there were a lot of uh, discussions about Jews. Uh, there were quite a few girls in my school who had a very poor opinion of Jews, and especially when it came to Israel, when talking about Israel and Palestine. Um, and they would talk about how the Jews are cursed and Allah hates the Jews and things like that. Um, and there were we, we held a lot of assemblies saying that we shouldn't be saying things like that, especially not in public, because it's not good. Um, but no one... Like, there are ayahs in the Quran that curse the Jews and the Christians. No one ever talked about that. Um, it was just, you know, be good to be kind to people, don't bother people, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, like, so far, what I am hearing is, and since you are a very good student in Madrasa, in Islamic school, uh, yeah. and you are learning about Muhammad, and you wanted to honor Muhammad in a sense, uh, with the covering up and you were memorizing the Quran and doing your homework in the intention yeah you are there to learn and actually you in it seems that you didn't have that much problem with Islam it is like really really this lovely religion it for me it was just second nature um I think because I you know I saw my father become more religious and in my mind that made him a better person because he, you know, he stopped acting so erratically. He, he changed his behavior. He, he was more focused on what he wanted to do. So I saw that. And then I was put into this bubble where everyone's a Muslim and I don't get to meet any other kinds of people. And I'm taught that this is good. So in my child brain, uh, it, it was perfect. Like I, I couldn't see another way of living. Um, and then, you know, there were all these adults telling me that, uh, the way that other people are living are wrong. Look at how horrible their lives are. You know, people are getting murdered. People are getting raped. Like this doesn't happen in this, in an Islamic society. It just doesn't happen. And if it did happen, they would be severely punished. Yeah. Um, so to my mind, there was nothing wrong with it. And as I got older, like as when I was like 14, 15, and I would argue with people mainly online because I wasn't allowed to be around other people. Um, when I would argue with people, I would say the same things. Uh, like a, a lot of the people that I argue with now, I see them saying the same things that I used to say. And it really it, it really puts me in a strange state of mind where I understand where they're coming from, but I also don't understand how blind they can be. Um, but I also do because I was raised like that. And I, I, I also understand how terrified I was of displeasing God and... and um, this fear that he would be angry with me and that I would burn in hell because he's angry with me. Yeah. Um, and well, never to question him on anything. Yeah. One um, of the thing is... So, sorry. One of the thing is fear, I think, is very, very successful tool. Yeah, I agree. And it, sadly, it is short term, but it is very successful tool. I remember, like, even at universities, 
we got beaten by teachers because you were simply asking questions. And yeah. in mosques, you get beaten because you couldn't recite. So you don't want to get beaten because of that fear. You do your best. And it is very, very effective. Like you learn and they stuck with you for a long time. It is yeah. very, very successful method. So you don't want to go to hell. but And hell is a terrible place. So what you do, you do your best to be perfect. And do your best to be more perfect and more perfect. Uh, would you say in that stage as you are engaging with people online and you are uh, you've got big fear of hell would you say if someone asks you to go and take someone else's life would you say you would do it what do you mean like if someone said okay um, Allah will be very pleased with you if you kill a Christian or if you kill these kafirs, those kind of things. If I if if I'm to be completely honest, if someone was to say that to me and then provide evidence for what they were saying, I probably would have done it. Good, you woke up early. Good, you woke up early. <laughs> I'm I'm so grateful that, to an extent, I wasn't exposed to like all the ISIS stuff that was around at the time because. The, the amount that I was gone, like, it, it, it was crazy. I, I, like, people ask me, like, I'm pretty chaotic as a person, and people ask me, like, do you not know how to be organized? And I, I tell them I have a fear of being organized now because of how disciplined I was as a Muslim. Because I used to pray five times a day, I had a regiment for sleeping, I had a regiment for eating, I had a regiment for everything. It was almost like living like a soldier, but obviously not in wartime. Um, but because there was this, like, even music, like, you, music is haram. If I was watching something or if I was in the middle of the street, if I heard music, I would close my ears, like, I would put my fingers in my ears so I didn't hear it. Because it was just such a, it was this thing, like, if I sinned, then there's this chance that I might die and that I might go to hell. Um, it, I was so, so lost and so far gone that I was, it, it's, it, I'm so glad that I wasn't exposed to all of the terrorist stuff because I don't know what would have happened. Um, would you say life as a Salafi Muslim and yeah. life as a Salafi Muslim woman in somehow was satisfying you fully? I think being a Salafi Muslim woman um, was only satisfying because I didn't have anything else to do with my life, if I'm being completely honest. Like, my education wasn't was completely imperfect because we didn't have proper teachers and everything that I learned. Like, I passed most of my exams, almost all of my exams, but I only passed because I took the initiative to pass. Many of the girls who were in my school didn't pass their exams. Um, so that was one thing that I could drive my life towards, but that was obviously finite. Um, you know, there was only so many exams that I could take, and my parents and my family had no intention of sending me to a higher education, so I didn't go to university. Um, so after that, and up until that, the only thing that I could commit to and bear my life towards was being a good Muslim. And I think that that was the only reason why it was fulfilling. Um, you know, I didn't have any aspirations. I didn't have any dreams for my life. My only goal was to please God. And whatever that meant, that's what I did. Um, and I think that that's, to an extent, I think that some people find fulfillment that way. It's, that it's, it's one clear goal. You just follow rules. Um, and I think in another sense, people who convert and people who don't, you know, who weren't that way and then convert to be this way, think that it's it's again it's just one direction to go in like with islam there's very few things that you can debate and argue are right or wrong um everything is kind of laid out in islam so as long as you follow the path you're on it um to add to the last point that i was making about the violence thing the other thing that i remember from when i was a teenager was that i used to idolize um, these warring characters. So Muhammad himself was a warlord, but there were other characters within his story. So like Hamza, his uncle, 
Khalid ibn Walid, um, some women like um, Nusayba bint Khalaf and a few others that I've, I've forgotten now. But I used to idolize those people who used to go and fight. Like those were, the, that were, the, it was a very romantic idea in my head because as someone who, who had never faced a true struggle in life, um, you know, who had never understood true violence and true war, there was no other way for me to picture it except how people were presenting it to me, which was in a very romantic way. Oh, these people died for, for what they believed. They were martyred. That was something good that you did. Um, so that idea in and of itself is the dangerous one. And it was one that I was drawn to. Yeah, and especially if you are not encouraged to question things, it's all, yeah. it's all so awesome, so beautiful, and you want to be actively part of it. Um, yeah. Uh, that, oh, is, that is a question. Um, I, I will come back to that in a bit. Um, you said um, probably your family wouldn't send you to higher education. Um, did you ever ask them why they why wouldn't they send you to get go to university or high school? Uh, I, I did because um, I'm I'm an active student. I love learning. I've always loved learning. Um, I think that's why I felt so far into the Islam hold is because I just I liked learning about it. Um, and I I did ask my father like if why won't you send me to university? Like why can't I go? Because it would at that time it wouldn't have cost him anything because the government would have covered it. Um, oh, he we would have gotten a grant. I would have been educated for free. Um, and he said it's because there are no segregated universities and um, he was afraid. He said that a lot of people who go to university lose their faith um, and, and I should prioritize my faith and I should focus on becoming a good wife and a good mother and not focusing on um, getting a job because a job was a man's thing to do. Um, you know, men bring the money home, women look after the kids. Um, and I asked my mother, my mother who actually did go to university, but I didn't find that out until like the last year of her life. Um, I asked her and she said, well, if you're not going to become a doctor or a teacher, then there's no point in going to university because what else are you going to do? Um, sadly, that is still reality in the, lots of parts of the world that you cannot get education because you are a woman. And because yeah, yeah. it all goes back to the teachings of Islam. And uh, aim is soon after you kind of finish the madrasa, finish the Islamic school, you will get married, make babies, and then make more babies, and then make more babies. That's the kind of plan. And as you are making more and more and more babies, in one point you will improve your cooking skills. That's all it is. Well, uh, it I've is been cooking since I was like 12. So. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, it's kind of part of, part of the part of the <laughs> world, uh, part of being woman in um, in Islam. Yeah, um, I remember uh, someone, for example, she um, she was burned with hot water uh, as mm. like teenage, and mm. all of her leg was like first degree burn, and her skin kind of had a water under under the skin it was like awful and she was not taken to hospital because she was teenage and there was a possibility she will be, she will be treated by man doctor therefore like she suffered for like over a month with lots of um, medicines like apple uh, uh, candle lots of different things because if she's taking to hospital, man will see her leg, and that is inappropriate, and she's teenage. Yeah. And we know applications of education. So when you go to university, when you go to the school, suddenly your brain will start thinking and new life will come out. And good thing is now, even though education is not uh, acceptable, there is internet where people can have access to lots of informations um yeah. so what happened with all this lovely is uh have you okay this is another personal question mm -hmm. as a muslim have you 
seen domestic violence? Was that common in the community? Um, within my own family, I, I have to be completely honest, we didn't integrate a lot with communities. We stayed with our family. Um, yeah. If we did integrate, it was just with people in the mosque. And um, the mosques that we went to later on didn't really have a policy for beating up kids. I just didn't see it in the mosques that we went to later, um, which is good. I'm glad that they took that out. Um, but within my own family, I, I saw a lot of domestic violence, um, mainly with my brother. And it was pure, almost always religiously motivated because my brother wasn't he wasn't the keenest prayer. He wasn't the best at reciting Quran. He wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't as interested in, in religion as I was. Um, so he would, and if he did something like rebellious as a teenager, he, he, he wasn't the smartest, so he couldn't hide it. So he would get caught a lot. So whenever that happened, my, my dad would beat him like really heavily. Um, and it was, and that, that's been happening since I was like a little kid. Yeah. Um, I don't even remember when it started, but I remember it's it's some of my earliest memories is my brother being beaten. He's only two years younger than me. Do you think um, is it effective way of training your child uh, by beating? And after that, oh. you are in education. Oh, absolutely not. I think that. Well, the thing is, the things that you learn when you're afraid, you only learn them because you're afraid, not because you're sincere. Yeah. And I think that with education, there needs to be sincerity. Um, I mean, I used to hear all the excuses from my dad, like, oh, it's for his own good. He won't change if I don't beat him. How am I going to save him if, I, if, if he doesn't change? Um, and it was just a case of, I, I, just, I, I just can't understand how as a father, as a parent, as someone who is meant to love their children, you can do that to, to your own child. Like, I, I just don't get it. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't beaten until I was 18, almost, 18 to 20. Um, and, my, and at that time, it wasn't religiously motivated, but it was um, obedience motivated. Like that's when I like I didn't rebel for a very long time, but after my mother passed away, and after I saw my father do some really just things that finally sort of broke him for me. Like I couldn't I couldn't make excuses for him anymore. I I started um, defying him. I started questioning him. And, you know, for small things like um, filling the pan up with too much oil, he would he would beat me for um, leaving a cup um, in the living room. He would beat me. I think the last time where I really did think he was going to kill me, it was because um, the house was wasn't tidy um, and the kids were watching cartoons, which they weren't allowed to do. Um, and and, you know, that it was for little things like that. And I think that you know, first of all, violence doesn't stop, it, especially if a person isn't encouraged to stop or isn't made to stop. Um, violence escalates. It doesn't ever get better. And second of all, it's just not a good way of teaching anyone anything because they're not doing the thing that you want them to do out of a want to do it or a need to do it. They're just doing it because they're afraid. I'm sorry that um, you had to go through that. Um, for me, just expose more of Islam because there is something encourages them. There is not someone or something tells that is wrong. And yeah, I'm I'm someone who is confident that fear is what is keeping Muslims in Islam. I I completely agree. And um, the one thing that I will say about violence and Islam, like a lot of people can say, oh, Islam is a religion of peace and Islam doesn't encourage violence. But the thing is, is that Islam doesn't prohibit violence. Islam doesn't outwardly say, don't beat your kids. Islam allows you to beat your children if they don't pray, which my father did to my brother. Um, and he prob probably would have done to me as a child if I, didn't, if I refused to pray, because he also did it to my sister. Um, 
and you know it wasn't reserved for boys it it, it stretched um you know islam allows the beating of your wife i've never seen my father beat my mother but also my mother wasn't a very rebellious person my mother would just do whatever my father said she just didn't like the earache that he gave her um but islam encourages you to do that you know not just think it allows you to do it yeah. it doesn't outwardly ban that so the fact that islam doesn't prohibit violence it doesn't outwardly prohibit violence and actually st- there are passages allowing it shows that islam and violence are just bedfellows they they belong together and you can never claim that islam is a religion of peace because of that if it was a religion of peace it would completely ban violence warfare and things like that is a whole other discussion but on a domestic level on a social level the fact that it allows and in some instances encourages violence is evidence that it's not peaceful yeah and uh when we look at the teachings of muhammad we see as you express that children were beaten because they did not pray um or they did not recite the quran um the way it was supposed to be stuff so it is something rooted in islam and since it was practiced by muhammad in the time of muhammad in presence of him therefore it is acceptable um what went wrong why like oh sorry before that one just one more question uh sure. this is personal again you don't have to answer and i apologize to those of you who are watching for the question so um in islam um females cannot fast and pray when they have their periods uh how were you able to understand that and how did you kind of deal with that after death of your mother because if your mother is dead and if you are not praying or fasting she is the one who tells your father why you are not fasting and praying so how, how um, those things work out i was out? i was very very open with my father um we used to talk about a lot of things in depth because he even everyone in my family found it weird um because me and my father we would talk like we were friends and i think for a time we were i i genuinely feel like I was my father's only real friend. Um because he would see people at the mosque and he had my relatives but he wasn't close with anyone but me. Um and we would talk about everything and if I wasn't praying I would just tell him I'm I'm on my period. Um we had lengthy discussions because he was also preparing me for marriage. We would have lengthy discussions about what was allowed in marriage and what wasn't, you know, sexually and things like that. We were very vocal about when it came to islam we talked about everything and um you'll find that with salaf salafi muslims they're not shy about things like that they will yeah. talk about things like that quite openly okay and um so you were talking about marriage you were preparing for marriage um did you date it with future husband how like how did that happen no <laughs> that's did, haram did you um, did you see him did you know his name Um so I've been proposed to a few times. The first time I was proposed to I was 15 and the man who proposed was 26 years old. Um I saw him, I met him. Um I don't know if he knew I was 15 years old. He seemed very uncomfortable from what I remember. Um and he refused to marry me because he did istikhara and had a dream that he saw me in fire, which I mean it's probably adds up now um if he was watching my videos now uh but um since then i'd been proposed to a few times uh i've never dated i've only ever seen the people that i was who were proposing to me or i was proposing to once i would meet them once and then usually they would decide not to marry me um i was never asked i was it was just assumed that i would marry whoever had me okay Uh, there is a saying in Turkey if you did not get married after is medrese after um islamic school you will never able to get married or if you reject your first proposal you will yeah. never get married um so um what did what went wrong with islam or with everything else <laughs> um with you to be fell in love with muhammad with, with you to fell in love with islam 
like for me everything seems everything seems okay so you are like living typical muslim life uh and you love muhammad all those kind of things so why did you end up being non-muslim so what happened with me um was that i just kept studying <laughs> it, that's essentially what happened um because i so there are for those of you who are unaware there are six pillars in islam um that you are, that you have to believe in uh to have faith there are five pillars of islam so you're praying you're fasting your testimony your shahada your hajj uh, and your charity um but with faith there are six articles that you have to believe in and that's allah his messengers his books his angels the last day and in predestination and i went through each one studying each thing so i learned everything i could about allah as as a god who he was how he was um his characteristics um i learned about the messengers and the, all their stories and that was the best part of it i think that i i really enjoyed learning about the stories uh i learned about the angels there are only about four or five that are mentioned by name in the quran and in the sunnah um and there's not much not to believe there like why wouldn't you at that stage why wouldn't you believe in angels um <coughs> then there's books and there were four um four revealed by allah sent to different messengers and those were the zabur torah injil and then the quran and all of the other ones have been corrupted uh and then there's the last day which you have to believe in that allah is going to judge you one day and send you to paradise or hellfire and the last thing um that i was studying was qadar or predestination and something i just couldn't wrap my brain around was why allah would create disbelievers and sinners and then also create hellfire and know that they would go to hellfire um it was something i couldn't understand but i think that i buried it for a long time because every time i asked a question and i asked extensively I asked my my personal teachers I asked um like TV imams and sheikhs I asked my father I asked different masjid imams and none of the answers were satisfying and eventually my father said that look you shouldn't question qadar um every single um sect in islam that's misguided has always divided on the issue of predestination so I left it for a few years I just thought okay I'll just leave it up to god and that's it um but after i left my father's house in 2015 um it wasn't it wasn't my family who saved me from that house it wasn't muslims who saved me it wasn't my community who saved me everyone was aware my whole family was aware of what was happening in my house what was happening to me my whole community was aware i used to tell you know and every time that i sat for in a mosque i i was telling them what was going on and their answer was always sabr have patience allah will you know guide you whatever um and it it was disbelievers it was kafirs it was mushriks it was all of these heathens and infidels who had taken me out of my house and had saved me and i like for a whole year i was going back and forth like how can i believe in a religion that will punish these people who have done nothing but good for me like say what you want about my dad maybe he wasn't the perfect muslim or whatever but what what about these people who saved me like how how can i believe in a religion that tells me not to associate with them tells me that they're degenerates tells me that they are they are misguided and they are evil when they are the only people who helped me in my time of need like i can't believe in that i i just i'm going to cry i'm i just can't believe in that and so how did they take this my family yeah my family didn't know um i told one member of my family because i lived in uh one of my uncle's houses um for about 2 years after i left my father's house i went i went from house to house quite a bit um but i lived in his house for the longest after i left my father's house and his wife is quite liberal um so i had told her early on and her immediate response was you need to get married because our family is not going to stand for this but if you're married then you'd be protected and i said but i don't i, I don't want to keep pretending that i'm a muslim and she said well then you have to choose your ties with your family 
or your freedom then. Um, and then about six months, after, and she didn't tell anyone. She was aware, I told her, and I, I'm glad that I did because at that point, I don't think I could have kept it in for much longer. Um, but about six or eight months after that, I just decided I was going to, I was going to leave the family. So I took all my things out of their house. Um, I, at that, I lived with my then boyfriend for about two weeks before finding a place of my own. And I declared to the world in a YouTube video that I wasn't a Muslim anymore. And I was completely disarmed. Um, okay. Don't cry, okay, on YouTube. <laughs> I'm not very good with the emotions. Um, I just want to kind of, express something or emphasize something what we hear is not something new mm. uh, fear is what keeps muslims in islam education and love and freedom is enemy of islam the moment your brain cells start moving and thinking the moment you see, actually, you have to make a choice between Islam or freedom. That's the moment just you see, actually, they cannot work together. They cannot work together. And that I'm like, there are lots of people out there who are like you, who's stuck in Islam, and there is a fear, and of course, there is a consequences when individual makes a choice to walk away from Islam. And then you had to go through that. So what what it meant for you to uh, give up your... What it meant for you to, in the practical sense, choose freedom versus Islam? I think initially, when I first realized that Islam wasn't the truth, when I first said it to myself, that I wasn't a Muslim anymore. I think it broke me because my whole life was a lie. Like I, I couldn't get past the fact that I'd lived 20 odd years doing, you know, these rituals and, you know, having this regiment and being disciplined for nothing, you know, like it was completely meaningless. I think it, in a sense, it broke me because I didn't know what to do with my life. I didn't know how to live my life. Um, and in, in a sense, I just wanted to disappear. Like, I, I, I wasn't suicidal, but at the same time, like, I didn't know what was the point of me living anymore. Um, but after I kind of got over that, and it took about a year, um, I, I had to go through therapy. I had to make some new friends. Um, I had to go out in the community and do things. Uh, I, I volunteered for that whole year. Um, with all these different organizations, with dogs, with uh, people, with community centers, with charities. Um, and I think afterwards I realized, like, the whole world is open to me now. Like, I can, I can do what I want to. I can, I'm allowed to have dreams. I'm allowed to have aspirations. I can feel the wind in my hair. And it was, to, when I say this to people, they think, oh, well, that's small things. Everyone has that. And my, my issue is, is that I didn't have that. I didn't feel the wind in my hair for, you know, over 10 years since I put it on. No, over that even, you know, since I was like five years old, I'd never felt the wind in my hair. I'd never felt the rain on my skin. Like, it, I, I just didn't have that. And it's such a simple thing to want, but that's, I didn't know I wanted it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm currently doing my degree. Never could have done that if I stayed a Muslim. Never could have done that if I stayed in my family. Um, you know, I can choose the person I want to be with. It doesn't have to be someone my family chose. It doesn't have to, or also it doesn't have to be someone from my country, from my background, which isn't an Islamic thing, but is a thing that my father would have wanted and something that my family would have wanted. Um, you know, I'm, I'm free. I think that's just it. I, I'm free. And I think it's such a hard thing to explain people who haven't been through it because it's something they already have and it's something that they take for granted that they, you know, they have this wonderful education system that makes them think critically and makes them, you know, gives them tools to, to live. But I was never given that. So 
having the ability to access it is one of the biggest blessings of leaving Islam. And yeah, it's difficult because I don't have my family. I'm often very lonely. But aside from that, I've found a family outside of that. I found my surrogate family and I'm free to do whatever I want to do. And I think that people don't understand how important that is. Um, thank you for ex expressing that openly. Uh, it is. It it seems to me that it is ex very similar to someone who never saw anything in their life. Yeah. First time they are seeing sky is blue. Which while they were blind, you were explaining them what the color blue look like. So that something they cannot kind of feel it, they can't see it, but you were explaining first time you saw what the sky, how, what Budu is in sky. It's like very, very similar um, expression is coming out. How did your family, uh, like, how did you tell your father that you left Islam? Um, at that point, I was on bad terms with my father because I had left his house in 2015. The police had to, had to take me out of his house um, because he almost killed me. Um, so at that point, I didn't have any contact with him. But my family's general reaction, and he hasn't had contact with me since, um, my extended family has tried to force us into conversations but or even contact, but um i honestly at this point and even at that point i didn't want any contact with him i'm not ready for that kind of contact i don't know if i'll ever be ready for that kind of contact but um i mean only the future can tell that uh but the general reaction of my family was that they immediately um so the first thing they did was ban YouTube in all of their houses and the only reason i know that is because i have contact with a few of my cousins who told me that um, so they're not allowed to access YouTube anymore. Um, and the second thing was uh, they they started speculating. They said that I left Islam and I abandoned my family to marry a white boy, um, and I'd run away to his to live with him or whatever. Um, they said that they that I did this because I was cursed or I was misguided, um, and that. You know, I, I just want to be like the kafirs uh, and I want to be a degenerate and I want to have fun and party and all that stuff all the time. Um, that was the general reaction. I still get comments from them on my different social media platforms from time to time telling me that I'm a whore and I've let my mother down and my, my mother's dead, by the way. Um, so it's a big thing for them to say something like that. Um, and that um, I've abandoned all my siblings um, and that my father was right to beat me and things like that. Um, so that's that's been the general reaction. Uh, there are members of my family who are better and slightly more understanding, but just can't do anything at the moment because the pressure from the, the more extended family is just uh, such a huge consensus of, of she's evil, so you should avoid her. Um, I just received a message. Um, someone sent me a picture of you when you were Muslim, which apparently you shared on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, would you be happy for me to um, share that on YouTube? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, but um, I don't know how to do that because that came <laughs> from Skype. Um, so let me just... I'm not sure how to do that. Let me see. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I okay, can so you. you are here. Um, so I will just share that picture. But um, living Islam cost you. Living Islam helped you to gain freedom, but it yeah. also cost you all you had your family, your community, your relationships. Yeah. And it is it is hard because uh, the family whom you love, whom they loved you, they cared for you, now 
because of your belief, because of your belief that now you don't have them. Yeah. Um, I recently heard that my grandmother said that if I was in Bangladesh, she would burn me alive. Um, so I'm glad I'm not there. Um, but yeah, I think leaving Islam, even just becoming more liberal, taking off your hijab, it comes with a really heavy price um, of you losing your family, of you losing... And if I'm being completely honest, love was another one of those things that I only discovered after leaving Islam. I didn't know what it was. I doubted it existed before because my family was never really loving. And I couldn't really say that when I was a Muslim because I didn't know what it was. But in hindsight, now knowing and having felt love and knowing what it is, they, they were never loving. They were just... They were just constantly giving me tools of how to be a better wife and how to be a better mother. Like that was it. They were just they were just um, like brain brain dumping all this information about how to cook better and how to dress better and how to you know be more girly. And I was never really a girly person growing up. I always liked boy things. So it was like trying to erase that. And like I enjoyed sports and I, I enjoyed like action movies and things like that. And it was trying to erase that and make me more girly and make me more appealing to a man, teaching me how to clean, like instilling this OCD mentality into me. Um, and that's all that all of those relationships were. And if I can be completely frank, I honestly don't miss most of the members from my family. I just miss having the concept of a family, yeah. if that makes sense. Like, I, I miss more the concept of, oh, yeah, that's my family. If I fall on hard times, they'll support me, which evidently is not the case. But I don't miss actual members of my family most of the time. Um, I can say that I miss my mother because she's passed away and I can never experience her again. But other members of my family, I, I don't feel any kind of, like, even familial relation to anymore. Because they were never really there for me. Um, so on the YouTube now, people can see your picture. So don't be surprised if you see your picture on YouTube. Okay? <laughs> That's fine. Um, what, what is the most... Uh, uh, those are personal questions and I don't like want to kind of put your life in danger extra. Um, what would What was the most amazing moment you remember with your family as a Muslim? I think, uh, what do you mean by amazing? Like a happy moment? Yeah, for example, um, let me put in different way. So you haven't, you left your family because you didn't want to be Muslim. How yeah. was first Ramadan and how was Iftar? Um, after I left Islam, or before I left Islam, um, because after, if after you left, and... after you left Islam, so my understanding is, um, if that like that breaking the fast is very big deal in Muslim community, so you do yeah. with your family. Mom's job is to she wakes up in the morning and she just prepares food for evening, and then that goes on for thirty days, and the, yeah conversations um conversations fellowship uh family time takes place around that dinner dinner table when people break up their fast it's like amazing moment so yeah how did you cope how did you pass through first ramadan without having those moments or with like knowing that you don't have family who who you can go and give hug to? Well, I think the first Ramadan I experienced as an ex-Muslim um, was tough because, well, the whole, I would say all of last year, because it's only been a year since I left my family, all of last year has been tough because it's just been me by myself um, just trying to do everything and also trying to learn how to live by myself. But the first Ramadan, because I also have Muslim friends at work and um, 
in my personal life and they'll tell me that they have iftars and things and they they know where I'm, where I come from I don't tend to hide things among my friends um so they'll tell me like if if you're feeling lonely or if you want to spend iftar with someone you can come spend iftar with us and I did a few times I I I broke um well I didn't break a fast but I I did iftar with a few of my muslim friends um this well last year but it was the first year outside of my family and um that helped a little bit but i think i spent a lot of last year crying i i spent a lot of last year feeling lonely um christmas was difficult as well because that that's another time where you spend time with family and it's just people talking about their family and me just being very jealous <laughs> because i don't get that um so it's tough but it's just a reality that i have to accept um and that's just that's just what my life is now well what is what is lonely lonely i think it's different to being alone i think that you can be alone and you can be okay but when you feel lonely you feel like you're the only person in the world um I mean I have I have everything. I have anxiety, I have depression, I have PTSD. Um so those things don't help. Um so the loneliness is what like triggers it. It's the start and then it's just constant well there's no point to anything. That's that's what it feels like. Um and to me as someone who didn't strive for any kind of career or towards any kind of educational goal my family was everything um you know i raised them i raised my siblings for example and they i would say that they're the only members of my family that i truly truly miss because they were just they were just babies when i left them um i'm sorry for asking that personal question um no no you don't have to be sorry <laughs> i told you don't, i told you to not cry on my live stream i don't I'm i don't do that ma- that well with the emotions <laughs> i'm doing my best <laughs> um, it is doesn't matter um which part of the world you live doesn't matter how much freedom you gain but it has huge cost for anyone yeah. who gave up they all they had was their family their community they gave that up to express their belief on something or nothing or reject the belief they had and it cost them it cost them their family and in britain I I remember first Christian family's house I went. Uh, yeah. first British house I went in Britain. They had a son who just came back from university. And mother in front of me told him to move out. I was like, what <laughs> kind of family is this? So we are talking we are not talking about that kind of family who wants to encourage you to have your independence and move out. Family yeah. is all you have and now you have to because you said I don't want to be Muslim anymore, I don't believe in Muhammad and in Allah anymore. I don't want to practice that anymore. The ones Ooh, who so I don't want to get you, married. <laughs> yeah, the ones who, who looked thing. after you they don't want to do anything with you. Yeah. And those of you who are watching uh doesn't matter if someone who left Islam is Christian or not Christian yet, I want us to be aware of their needs of another human who loves them and who cares for them. Uh time of family times are very difficult for those people. If they, if they are Christians for example Sundays are very difficult time for them because Sundays is in the body of Christ in the church it is the family time but they've got no family to go uh 
or all other activities like you come home that you've got no one who who says oh i was waiting for you to have the dinner um those things are hard so please please be aware of them and uh look out for them intentionally and pray for them and step in when there is a practical need uh, just one question on family again but please please tell me that you don't want to answer the questions um okay when you were told if you were in bangladesh they will burn you because you are not muslim anymore uh how did that make you feel and today do you start remember the uh sound of that voice that your loved one looks at you and then says if you were in bangladesh you would be burned because you left islam i think when it first started happening so i want to say like a year or two ago when people started noticing that i wasn't as practicing as i used to be um because i'd left islam in secret but i hadn't told anybody um when i first started hearing it 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 really got to me um but more recently so this i heard on new year's day and it wasn't directly told to me someone had told me that my grandmother said this um i think it would have been different if my grandmother had said it to me directly but even then i don't think that i would have reacted at all and the only thing that i did when this i can't reveal who it is because she'll get in trouble but um this family member who did tell me um the only reaction i had was to laugh because like i i don't know what else i can do um i'm not in bangladesh but i know i can't go back now um because that's a safety hazard uh but i don't know i i think that a lot of the time when my family members reach out and they leave uh, me these lovely messages there's very little i can do but sort of read them send them to my friends and laugh at them because even though i'm out of the family even though i'm disowned and they want nothing to do with me all they can do is think about me and talk about me and leave their comments about me i i don't know like when i disassociate from someone and i haven't done it often but when i disassociate from someone i stop talking about them i stop thinking about them they're no longer in my brain but for some reason even though i'm apparently not a part of this family anymore um no one is allowed to have contact with me and i you know i'm cursed like you're not meant to even be thinking about me they can't stop talking about me and i think that that is hysterical i think that that's so funny and i will never stop laughing about that <laughs> because it means that i'm making an impact a small one but an impact <laughs> um when so now you know the consequences of leaving islam and yeah. you have seen um uh, you have seen sorry you have seen the uh, reaction and you have seen the cost and price in practical side you had to pay to mm. uh move on from islam uh what would you do differently or if there is a opportunity for you that your family t- turns to you and then says okay come back we have got husband for you or ignore the husband no one will get married with you anymore but now we have um we have other things for you come back would you go back to islam after you uh seen the price of um being a uh, without islam i think i don't know how i would react if my family told me that i could go back because i've realized that i don't like most of them i think that they're very toxic people and i think that to an extent islam 
helped with that that they that it made them more toxic because it gave them more things to judge people by um in terms of what i would have done differently i wish i had left islam earlier i wish i had left islam much earlier i would have fought a lot harder if i knew how to to get my siblings out of that house because i was prepared to raise my siblings but i didn't know a how to do that on a social service level and b i didn't i wasn't financially stable i'd never worked a day in my life that that's the truth of it i'd left education and i just started looking after my siblings after my mother got ill um but in terms of whether i would ever go back to islam no i think that after leaving islam it was the first breath of air that i felt what i truly felt like i was being honest with myself when i was a muslim everything i did was out of fear everything i did was out of this blind devotion for a god that i could couldn't even prove you know all of these teachings and all of these relics of the past that i devoted myself to i had no proof that they would do anything or be of any benefit to me but i did them because i was afraid and because i had this blind devotion to this god and i never want to be like that again i never want to blindly follow anything anyone i want to you know realizing that this is the only life that i have that i can prove i don't want to waste my time i want to make the most of my time and i want to find fulfillment in the things that i really want to do and not just do them because i'm afraid of someone else or something else or something might happen it's it's to me i just see that way of living as so cowardly and so it it's almost as if why are you even alive i mean maybe that's harsh but to me that's what it feels like if you are not truly devoted and truly you know internally you are you are actually wanting to do the thing that you're doing then why are you doing it i don't understand and i i like it's not something that can resonate with me anymore so whether or not i would ever go back to islam is out of the question i would never do that again so even though you've seen the price and you've seen yeah. the consequences yeah still you don't want to do anything with islam yeah it's um it's almost like um have you seen the matrix no no, no. <laughs> but um basically hopefully people in the audience have uh, the way that i describe it to people simply is that it feels like that moment in the matrix where he wakes up in the in the pod and he realizes that everyone is just batteries for these machines and he takes that uh that tube out of his throat and he he becomes free he'll never want to go back to that state and i don't ever want to go i never want to be part of the matrix again like i'm free i know what real life is now um and that's what i want that's what i want out of my life also you should see the matrix it's one of the best movies that i've ever seen um no I, the movies are very long for me to watch i don't even brush my hair um <laughs> Uh, I do like when I need to cut it but other than yeah. I don't. Um so even though prices you had to pay and you are still paying it is yeah. worthy that you will not go back to Islam. No, nope, never. People have tried. <laughs> <laughs> and I am sure was um was it like trying with flowers and roses and hot chocolate or was it trying in different way it was like trying to mix oil and water it's just not going to happen <laughs> okay um so there are a couple of question um if there anyone has question um please put at dcci ministries in front of your question sorry in front of as you write dcci ministries put at sign in front of dcci ministries and then i can ask your questions to fay if that's um that's what you want um 
but uh, by the time I keep eye on the questions. So um, recently I've been sent some of um, videos that people are becoming Muslim. Main okay. British British women are becoming Muslim because it is amazing religion. Okay. Um, what do you think about it? I think that that just gave me a very visceral response. Um, I've got oxygen I don't, if you need. I don't understand. Yeah, just like the, the, the breath was taken out of me. Um, I don't understand these women who, and honestly, it, it's almost offensive to me. Like these women who were born into families where they have their freedoms and they take their freedom so much for granted that they give it up freely. Um like I, I I just find it really, really disgusting. And obviously it's their choice. They can believe whatever they want and you know, whatever they're going through, I hope they get out of it. But first of all, I don't understand it because you live in this world where you can literally do anything and you choose to not choose. Um it, it's literally a coward's way out. Like I absolutely detest it. Um and the second thing is, is that why would you want that? You're, you're immediately made subordinate to men. You have to obey your husband. Um, you, you get half of the inheritance of a man. You get half the witness of a man. You're considered less intelligent because you have periods. You're, you're considered less in your religion because you have periods, even though it's completely not your fault. Um, you have to prioritize becoming a wife and a mother and you have to put all your hopes and your dreams and your aspirations on the back burner to serve everyone else. Um, you know, you see Muslim women suffering in the way that they do. And instead of, you know, standing by them and having their back and fighting for their right to be freer, for their right to be more equal, you decide to join the cohort of, of just misogynistic, awful people. I'm trying really hard not to swear. Um, just misogynistic, awful, terrible people. Like, I don't understand. It, it, it actually enrages me when I see... And, like, Sinead O'Connor recently became a Muslim. And the way she talks about Islam... First of all, she's not a proper Muslim, so I don't know what she's talking about. And second of all... Sorry. Second of all, the way she talks about it is just so ignorant and so uneducated. Um, it's, it's just misleading people and giving this image of Islam that it, that it isn't, and it's not helping. It's making everything so much worse, because what happens when a white woman converts to Islam is that everyone sends it in a family group text, and they say, oh, look at this white woman, you know, mashallah, she's become a Muslim. You know, we should, we should become more practicing to, to bring more people to Islam. When it's like, you know this person, this, this awful, ignorant human being, who, maybe not awful, but ignorant, absolutely, who's come to Islam and has become a Muslim and is, you know, wearing the hijab and doing all these Islamic practices, barely knows a thing about Islam, but she's taken the shahada anyway. And then, like, maybe, like, 10 days into it will be like, oh, you know what, this is not for me and I'm going to leave. And the percentage actually shows that. About 80, 70 to 80% of converts to Islam leave Islam within a year. Yeah. They don't stay Muslims. Um, Muslims will tell you that Islam is the fastest growing religion, but the reason why it's the fastest growing religion isn't because of its convert rate, it's because of its birth rate, yeah. that people are born into Islam. It's Baby, more babies, more babies, more babies. Drop it's, off, it's like, it's almost like a, a woman, you know, adopting this cult for 10 days, saying that it's great, and then peacing out and leaving forever. Like, that's what it feels like. And it's it's completely awful, and I, I just, I wish it would stop. Okay, so I've got a couple of questions, okay? Mm -hmm. So, before I ask my question, just want to emphasize something, okay? Wherever you stand in the life, you are young, old, ill, getting ready to die, getting ready to marry, there are a couple of essentials you've got to do. <laughs> Where, which stage, which stage you and die and marry okay? together. <laughs> which, whatever stage you are. First one yeah. is water is essential for life. Make sure you drink enough. That's the first thing. Second thing is 
keep away from Islam. That is the second thing. And then help people to keep away from Islam. Water and get away from Islam, keep away from Islam. That will help others live happily. Mm -hmm. So first question comes from Hazim Ali. Fay, did you read Sarah Mary? What is this one? Did you read Sarah Mary? Sarah Mary. I'm not sure. I'm gonna try and find the. Okay, I don't know what it is, but it's not like kind of in my bookshelves. Um, is it Sura Maryam? Is that what he's talking about? No. Yeah, I've no, read Sura Maryam. No, it doesn't say Sura though. It's a Sarah. Sarah. Yeah. I, in the beginning, I thought maybe it's talking about Sura Mary, but anyway. Okay, we are passing this question. Nothing personal. We are just moving on from the question. But sure. um, tell me what did you think about Surah Mary? Surah Maryam, Surah 19. Um, I'm not sure what the full content... I don't have a Quran anymore. I haven't read Quran in a good two years. Um, not properly, anyway. Um, Surah uh, from what I remember about Surah Maryam, it's mainly the story of Mary. Um, there's not much I can talk about. The story is definitely different from the biblical version in many different ways. Um, I I don't know. I don't, there's not much I can say about Surah Maryam. Uh, it's not a surah that I used to read a lot. The two surahs that I used to read the most were Surah Al-Kahf, which is the surah of the cave, and surah Yusuf, which is the surah Joseph. It's about the prophet Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, next question is: Are white converts are treated differently than born Muslims? Yes, <laughs> they're treated so much. They're treated as if they're like these um, saviors. <laughs> They, they're just treated as unicorns like you never see one and now one is here that is they're treated almost as if it's mythological and you need to touch this person for good luck like that's how they're treated um born muslims uh, even though they'll say oh, i'm so glad i'm born a muslim because it's so unlikely that you'd be born a muslim um and and they're lucky in that way converts are treated as though you know they were they were pulled out of like tar or something um, I don't know. Like they, 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 they had a near-death experience and they were saved. Um, it's I don't know. I, I think it's this bizarre case of racism because I, I haven't even seen black converts treated like that the way that white converts are. Um, they, there was a there was a Hajj group that recently posted these pictures of converts who had gone to Hajj and they were all white, all white converts. No black converts, no mixed race converts, no Chinese converts, no um, South American converts, all white faces. Now you tell me what that's about, because I don't know. Because from what I've been told, all people are turning to Islam. So why isn't there more representation of other people? Because it is very awesome religion and teachings is double awesome. Just disgusting. I hate it. Just, ugh. <laughs> um, there are a couple of there are a couple of questions about your family. I'm gonna move on them, and there are a couple of questions. So, um, you left Islam, and now you are dealing with the consequences. Uh, yeah. it. Uh, have you looked at the teachings of um, Christian faith? There are like questions around this circle, so I'm just like putting that in a yeah. different way. Um, not really. The most that I've learned about Christianity has been from my other atheist friends, and I do have an interest in learning about them. Um, I'm not too interested in finding a new religion i think i definitely need to do a bit more self-finding before i look for another religion because again i don't want to mask all my problems with a belief um and i'm quite as my journey with islam probably shows i'm quite an obsessive person so i would rather stick to me finding myself first before i you know find christ or is that what you call it um 
good vocabulary but, but I, you are learning from at least. Yeah, I, I am learning something from them. <laughs> uh, I'm learning a fair bit from them because while they are a skeptic community, they're quite um, well versed in a lot of different things. Um, and I like talking about religion. Religion is one of the subjects that I really enjoy learning about, um, just casually. Um, so I am trying to learn more about it. I have learned some stuff about Hinduism. There's some things that I like about it, some things that I don't really like. Um, and uh, I've learned a fair bit about Buddhism, which, again, a lot of things that I like about it, some things I don't like. And I think that that's what I'll find with religions is that there there will be some things that I like and some things that I don't like. But um, I don't know. I, I haven't learned probably as much of Christianity as I should know. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying just at a casual rate. Okay. Um, it is something I guess we will be disagree, even though we have agreement regarding Islam. For me, yeah, uh, true freedom, true fulfillment of life can mm. only come through Lord Jesus Christ. There is no any other way. And I have seen how lives have been changed and transformed because what Jesus offered them. But uh, I, I've been very intentional to not uh, put your head on the wall to talk about <laughs> Jesus, even though I'm someone who is so confident there is no any other way for us to be fully human. But um, that will be, I'm not going to push on those questions. And I'm sure I, mean, I will I've, receive some I've emails heard speak, on this. I've heard you speak at Speaker's Corner. You're definitely passionate about it. And I've seen other people who... Um, who talk about Jesus at Speaker's Corner, and there's a huge contrast between people who talk about Christianity and people who talk about Islam. <laughs> there's a huge contrast. Um, I remember recording some of that. I must have put it in a video um, when we went uh, and I met you for the first time, um, because there was this gentleman who was talking about Jesus and there were these Muslims who were calling him a donkey or something. I don't know. Um, He's so every week. There's, there's a huge contrast. It's ridiculous. And I would rather be preached at nicely than be told that I'm a donkey for believing what I believe. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, the things happens at Speaker's Corner is very in the very different context, but it's the nature of yeah. Speaker's Corner. Just a, yeah. um, another question. You might know the answer. Uh, mm. So when white or black people, when human beings who are made in mm. God's image made a decision to become a Muslim, are you aware of the cases that those new believers, new Muslims, have been persecuted or got death threats or kicked out from their families? Are you aware of those kind of cases? Um, there are some cases that um, we've dealt with in that regard um i have known because i work in education and i've worked um not directly with social services but i worked with a community center so i worked alongside social services um there are some instances where people will be harassed or kicked out of their homes for becoming a muslim but usually it will be because their family is from another um quite conservative or quite extremist faction of another religion so be that hinduism judaism christianity if if they're from quite an extreme faction of that that is the own those are the only cases we found and i think it doesn't really matter with muslims because i've seen muslims from liberal families be kicked out and harassed because they leave islam and i've seen muslims from conservative families well, ex-muslims from conservative families be harassed and kicked out from their homes because they leave islam it, there, there isn't really a gradient, whereas with other religions, because I, I'm aware of people who've become Muslims um, from a, a Hasidic Jew background, and I'm aware from a, sorry, a Jehovah's Witness background, um, and they were both kicked out. While they weren't um, attacked or beaten or anything like that, they were asked to leave um, because uh, they, they had become Muslims. And um, I think there are quite a few notable preachers as well who've, who've gone through the same thing. Um, 
So there are instances, but I don't think it, while I'm not trying to invalidate those experiences, I think those experiences need to be talked about um, because it is something serious. And honestly, it's 2020. We shouldn't be throwing people out of our houses just because they believe in different things. Um, but it kind of shies in comparison to the rate that Muslims will throw out their kids because they're gay, because they want independence as women, or because they have left Islam. It just doesn't compare. The The rate is way higher with the Muslim families. Yeah. And just a um, Christian point on that. Um, in Christian scripture, we are not given any right to burn people alive, put gun on their head, or try to uh, force them to become Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is no place for that in Christian scripture. We do have amazing story in Luke chapter 15, story of prodigal son. Son makes not only makes a decision to walk away, but in that culture, it's like awful decision you will ever make. Yet father doesn't send anyone to go and kill the son. Father waits for son to come. While Islam yeah. is ideology based on fear, which we see it's very successful, but Christian ba Christianity based on freedom and love. So God doesn't want, Lord Jesus Christ doesn't want anyone to love him because that person has been forced. Lord Jesus Christ doesn't want anyone to have a gun on, on her or his head to confess that they believe Jesus is Christ. Because that is not true love, and there is no place for that in Christian scripture given to human beings. Judgment will be done by God himself, but not by us. And um, in the future, as you look at the teachings of um, Christian scripture, my prayer is that you will meet with this God who is awesome, who is delightful, who, who is so perfect, and in his perfectness, he gives all of himself to humanity. That's all it is. And he doesn't force anyone to stuck with him. He doesn't force anyone to just beg him because, because, the, because individual is forced. There is full freedom. There is full true love. And it is just amazing goodness of God. But I was... I've been very intentional to not comment on those kind of That's things. That's okay. <laughs> um, just practical question. You might know the answer to this question. Uh, okay. When an individual decided to become a Muslim, mm -hmm. so um, when people born in um, Islamic family, in Muslim family, man has to go through the circumcision. And in yeah. some part of the world, females has to go through that as well. When... A, let's say white British man in his 40s become a Muslim do they uh -huh. get circumcised I think I don't think he has to but I think it is preferred because we have a story well it may be a biblical story as well you'll have to correct me on it or not but Abraham circumcised himself when he was very old so it's said that it's preferred but I don't think he has to. Um, am I wrong to understand, according to the Islamic tradition, circumcision has nothing to do with Abraham. It is about all about the cleanness. Oh, no, it's, it's absolutely to do with Abraham. That's where uh, it started. It is started <laughs> according to the Christian scripture, but in Islam, mm. Muhammad's reasoning is because it is the cleanness. Muhammad doesn't no. teach that as a covenant. I think that the reason why, Muhammad, well, first of all, Muhammad copied a lot of Jewish scriptures. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't really change much back, after that. He, he I mean, he's got Moses, he's got Jewish Abraham. Scripture. He copied fake scriptures. Yeah, he copied yeah. the fake ones and he made them true or whatever. Um, but I do think that the original reason for why Muslims circumcise is because of Abraham. And the reason why Muslims say it's because of cleanliness is because um, there are very few benefits to circumcision. Um, 
there is some benefits in terms of men. Uh, there are none in terms of women. There are very few in terms of men, but it's absolutely not necessary. Um, so they will say, oh, it's we do it for cleanliness. But I still don't see the logic of putting a child through that, like uh, putting a baby through that. Because I think Muhammad advised that babies should be circumcised and named, or boys should be circumcised and named um, on the seventh day after they are born. Um, I don't want to have the, this debate, but I would be challenging you that on. I would be challenging you on that because, so in Christian scripture, mm. circumcision is covenant God makes between himself and Abraham. Okay, that's the covenant right. promise takes place. In Islamic yeah. scripture, with my limited studying, that uh, circumcision is all about um, it is all about um, cleanliness. It, it does mm. not refer the covenant which has been made in Jewish scripture, as well as you get to see Muslims are getting so like probably your brother got circumcised before he turned to like ten or eleven something that. Yeah, so it is not on the eighth day or on the seventh day. So that's yeah, yeah. There is circumcision, but it is completely different purposes it could be um this is just what i learned okay this is what i remember and in christian scripture with the <coughs> fulfillment of jesus Sorry. we do not practice that so um okay you uh, adults when they convert to islam they are encouraged to do so mm. is that what you are saying yeah okay. i think that I, I don't think anyone talks about it but uh, from what i remember because i've asked i asked this question before um, because I, I felt like being silly that day. Um, I think my father's initial reaction was, why do you want to know that? And then I was like, well, I just, I, I asked a question, what's the answer? Um, and he said that it's probably preferred, but it's not going to be forced because he's an adult. Okay. Uh, that means, to me. this is nothing personal again. That means, especially men, yeah. uh, keep away from Islam. Yeah. It is painful <coughs> things happening that keep away from Islam. Um, okay. Um, I think I, I am aware that I miss, I miss some questions, but I can't do much about it because the questions I missed. Um, okay. Have you got your last thoughts or your last comments? Um, just that I'm glad that I did this and I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's been, it's been really good. Well, I am grateful that you made yourself available for us, but I'm also grateful that you felt comfortable to share your story because I am confident that, that there are hundreds of people, who, even thousands of people who are there who, who, who yeah. is in the same situation and they just need a little bit encouragement to say yes it is okay to choose mm. the truth it is okay to give up Islam and you will be encouragement to them um, so therefore I'm grateful and I'm sorry that um, there were the moments I made you emotional don't take that personal no, 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 no. that's did. absolutely fine it's, I think that I think that as someone who's just recently left Islam, recently been disowned, recently, all of this is very recent, I think it's really important for me to to get over this in this way, where if I don't do this, if I just turn up on a TV show 10 years from now and tell my story and there's no emotion, who's going to buy that? Who's going to believe that? Who's going to feel anything for that? No, I you know, as someone who is a young woman who's just experienced this and knows that there are, now I, re I have evidence that there are hundreds of people who are going through the same thing and don't know how to deal with it. It's, it's as though it's my personal responsibility to tell this story and, and let people know that this isn't an isolated incident. It's not just happening to them. And they're not lonely in this experience. Um, uh, yeah, so, my issue you know. was, my like, I think emotions are part of us as a human beings, and they are a good thing. Uh, my issue is I'm not good at dealing with them when people express their emotions. So, uh, That's fine. next I'm not time, good at dealing with them when we meet face-to-face, <laughs> -face, I, I, I will make sure I bring someone 
that like when you need someone to give you a hug, that person can do that uh -huh. while I am there. <laughs> <laughs> so we do express things very differently and I had a sister in my team called Dizzy she is the one like who steps in and then gives hug people when they are in need of it so hopefully next time we will practice that yeah um I just want to kind of express a couple of things for those of you watching uh, Islam is in very nice way of putting is worse than ugly. As an ideology, it is very, very ugly ideology beside being antichrist and all those things. It is very ugly ideology and none of the human beings should stay in it. It is dangerous to humanity. It is not only dangerous to Muslims, but it is also dangerous to humanity. It is dangerous to ex-Muslims. And I am aware there are lots of people are leaving Islam and statistics are showing um, converts are leaving Islam as well. But I am aware those who didn't have a choice to born into another religions or born into another family, yet you born into Islam and you had to follow Islam, there is a way for you to get out of it investment yeah. you are making is for your eternity investment you are making is for your life uh, and as faith said it is worthy it is worthy to make a decision to say islam is a false ideology and i don't want to have it that's absolutely okay yes there are the consequences of it and there is the price to be paid yeah but do you want to do you want to live in a fake and false lie? Do you want to live in a lie or do you want to make a choice to follow what you want to believe or follow truth? That, those are the choices and they, are, they have the consequences. For those of you who are identify themselves ex-Muslim and part of the Christian family, as a team, we do have... Uh, studies and then we meet with reg we, we've got studies and then we've got structures put together please feel free to drop me email at info at dccministries.com so we can take it from there we don't want you to be lonely we don't want you to be lonely christian who is struggling uh expressing the light with Jesus because there is no place for that in Christian scripture but we know there are the consequences of it and those of you who listened a human story today with all the emotions with all the wisdom with the, all the thoughts all you can come up is if I am the one who start questioning the ideology I am in I can look at those examples and I can get rid of this ideology and there are ways for you to be looked after. Those are like, don't stay in something that you believe it is false. Or don't stay in something you believe in, something uh, is not you, that you are forced to stay in it. It is, it has the, it has a price to be paid, but I am Christian and I believe it is worth the price to be paid. And Faye is a taste ex-Muslim. She believes it is worthy. It is worthy to give up this ideology in the sake of identifying it is a false ideology. For me, I have perfect example to follow. So if you are out there and if you are thinking, oh, how I can give up this ideology, just drop us email and then we can follow that up. Uh, Faye, there was a question on um, what is name of your YouTube channel and your social media for people to follow it up? So my YouTube channel is um, Faye the Most Gracious. Um, uh, you mean I'm like thinking Allah it's been linked a few gracious? times. Is that, huh? is that cheated from Allah the Most Gracious? Uh, my surname is Rahman. Okay. 
so that's what Rahman means is the most gracious. Um, so that's my YouTube name. Uh, and uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm not very active on Twitter uh, at the moment because it's just a hellscape. Um, there's just too many people screaming over each other. But I think if you wanted to follow my content, um, that's the best place to find me is my YouTube channel. Um, I would also like to say, alongside what you were saying, that if you want support from ex-Muslim organizations, if you want to meet more ex-Muslims, if you are an ex-Muslim and you just haven't joined a community yet, um, please do consider um, looking up the Council of Ex-Muslims website. We do have meetups and support groups. Um, Faith to Faithless also runs um, support groups and workshops and things like that. They also have one-to-one -one counseling meetings. Um, we also, you know, if you reach out just for advice and things like that, we're good for that. Um, there are other organizations around the world in America. There's the ex-Muslims of North America in, and, and there are loads popping up all over the world. We also have ex-Muslims of South Africa, ex-Muslims of Deutschland or the Netherlands. Um, we have ex-Muslims of Norway, ex-Muslims of Malaysia, of Sri Lanka. There are all these wonderful organizations popping up. I think a lot of them started in the last five years. Um, so they're quite small and they're quite intimate. Um, so, yeah, I, I would advise that you because one of the things that has helped me get over the whole loneliness thing is finding a community. And I really have found a community with through the organizations based here in the UK um, and online. So I, I would advise that strongly. Um, so there are lots of ex-Muslims in lots of different parts of the world. <laughs> yeah, and you can be one oh, of them. also ex-Muslims of Australia. They're they're quite they're on the rise at the moment. They're they're getting better than us. We need to step up. Um, but yeah. Um, so if you are willing to, if you are in a place, and even there are ex-Muslims in Malaysia, there are ex-Muslims in Saudi Arabia. There are ex-Muslims yeah. in Indonesia and mm. the ones I'm aware of in Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Ma Malaysia, uh, Pakistan, they are part of Christian family. So they ex-Muslim who become a Christian. The ones I know, but I don't know the like ex-Muslim atheists. So if anyone yeah. wants any connection with them uh, or help with discipleship, um, for them, just drop us email and then we can follow them up. But overall, okay. overall, there is huge ex Muslim out there because from tonight, once again, we heard that education is the enemy of Islam, freedom is enemy of Islam, love enemy of Islam, and. Thanks, God, also for the technology. Google, Shake, Internet, YouTube becomes another enemy for Islam. Now, people's eyes are opening more and more. And when people start studying more, when people start questioning more, there is no reason for them to st stuck in Islam. That's good news for us. And yeah. it's getting much easier with all those social medias because you can reach many people, I can reach many people, and yeah. we can all be small villages where people, Muslims are leaving Islam and becoming ex-Muslims. And my prayer is hopefully they will take one more step and come to worship Lord Jesus Christ. But I think at this, at today, our, we will be disagreeing on that. But for my, like, <laughs> that's my prayer. And um, thank you very much for all all of you who listened. Um, and I just want to express once again, if I didn't express well, I'm very grateful for you to bringing yourself fully, expressing and telling us your story and encouraging many people. So I really, really appreciate for that. Thank you very much, Bay. Thank you for having me. So, and God bless you all. Uh, and we will see you at Speakers Corner or another live stream. All right.